Trial Lawyers University, where the Titans come to train. Produced and powered by Law Pods. Well, we got my good buddy Satch Oliver with us today. And Satch and I were just together in Nash, Vegas for the AAJ. And that was a lot of fun down there. So, Satch, you spoke down there at the AAJ conference because you have a new book. Is this true? It is. It is. Uh, it's a, we're very thankful. And, and the book's doing great. Uh, it's Depositions on Trial. It uh, launched uh, June 24th, right before the AAJ Annual Convention in Nashville. And then we presented on the, the book in Nashville. And then, of course, we had a little reception to celebrate the book and book signing afterward and that went just too good to be true. AAJ did a great job, and I'm, I'm thankful for how well the book is being received. Well, you know me, I'm highly competitive, so now I take that as a challenge. So let's see what TLU, you know, because you're, 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 you are bringing that book and a lot of copies of it to TLU Vegas. So we'll see how your reception there is, you know, with your book. Right. I've got high expectations, Dan. So uh, you, I'm expecting you to deliver. Oh, I've got high expectations too, Saj. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But that was a great time down there in Nashville. In fact, it was such a great time. I think I have to, I'm, I think that in 2025, we have to do a, we have to do a production out there because you missed our last production, Satch, a couple of months ago in Huntington Beach, which was our. I oh, know, hated it. Which yeah. was, you know, my. I hate to miss yeah, it. Yeah, we missed you, but I know we had family things we had to take care of, and that's more important. But the good news is, is that we were constantly improving our ability to put together these uh, events, and and so we were able to we pull it off at a lower level than it would have been had you been there. But we, we, you know, challenges, right? It's like trial. Things change. You got to be flexible. You can't just throw in the towel. So we made adjustments, and we, and we, and we, and we, and, it, and, and we, it went, it went great, though. But not as great as Vegas is going to be. But before we get into Vegas and what we're going to be doing there, you know, let's first just let's talk about a few other things. You know, you've been how long have you been practicing now, Satch? Since two thousand and six, I became licensed. Uh, I've been with the firm just about 20 years now. And so it's uh, been, been a good run. Yeah. And, you, and you're one of the few people that, you know, is at the same firm you started with, but just a little name change. But that's always, that's always, you know, this guy, uh, Dirk Vandiver out of Missouri. He's been with the Popham firm for 50 years. That wow. to me, I'm like, wow. He was practicing 50 years, but in the same spot with the same, well, all the Pophams are dead now, but to be there for that long is just, you know, it's, it's incredible, actually. I don't know what to say about it, but incredible. But you got started at, with, you know, with, the, with Mr. Bailey some 20 years ago. Is yeah. that right? That's right. He had, a, he had a general practice there in Mountain Home, Arkansas. It's a rural area. And uh, I opened up an office in Northwest Arkansas in Bentonville, Arkansas, and started that office and started that practice and started a personal injury practice. And so we kind of had this, he's a wonderful mentor, but we kind of had an odd practice because he was three hours away doing a, a mainly general practice. And I was in Northwest Arkansas doing exclusive personal injury. And then uh, several years later, they decided to, to shut down that mountain home practice. And he, he and his wife moved to Northwest Arkansas and joined me uh, in, our, in our practice. And I was thankful for that. And then, of course, Mr. Bailey, he's quite a bit older than I am. I think he turns 80 this year. And so... Uh, yeah, he decided to retire from our firm at the end of this past year. And so, um, yeah, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience, a wonderful mentor, a dear friend of mine. And so um, you're excited for all the years of teaching that he he and uh, mentoring he bestowed upon me and able to go out there and, and do it now. And it's awesome. And you recently, you know, I noticed you recently changed the name of your firm from Bailey and Oliver to the Oliver firm. So tell us a little bit, you know, how it's that we evolved to, to, to Mr. Bailey's no longer no longer riding Mr. Bailey's coattails. Is that why, Satch, you feel like you've got enough street credibility to be on your own? So tell us about that transition. Yeah, well, it's been really uh, easy, I guess. It's not been that big of a, a transition. I, I, uh, 
you know, I've been running, I've been handling the cases we handle now with, with my team for the, I don't know, 15 years. And so it was not really, a, there's not really been a transition. I mean, I, I started the firm in Northwest Arkansas and we've been running these cases together uh, for years. And so it was simply uh, when he retired from our firm, uh, it was Mr. Bailey and his wife who, who wanted it to switch to Oliver Law Firm. And uh, so, hey, we did that. And so we had been kind of uh, before that, you would kind of had this like, who are you and what you're trying to meld both Mr. Bailey and myself. And, and so uh, he's not a horse person or not even a, 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 a agriculture oriented at all or anything. He lived in town, which is fine. It's just, it didn't go together. And so whenever we transitioned over to Oliver Law Firm, it came very apparent. It's like, hey, this is who we are. Let's be who we are. It's easy now. And so that's when you see kind of a branding or marketing shift to the Oliver Law Firm, our slogan, we'll take the reins, you know, and even the book has got the barn wood on it. And so, and then, you know, you've got the, uh, the horse everywhere now. And so it's just kind of, uh, it, that part has been a lot of fun, quite honestly, just kind of like, that's who I am. And the marketing team, they're kind of like, this is great. This is easy. I mean, so it's catchy. It's got, uh, it's got some grit to it. And so uh, that's, it's been a fun transition and it's been affirming because uh, this year has been, uh, we've been blessed beyond measure. It's been the most successful year, 2024, in uh, my history as a trial lawyer. And so we're very, very thankful for that. And so things are going well. Great. Well, I think they're going to keep going. Actually, they go better than well. They're going to go, they're going to go great, superior, awesome. It'd be like Trump was, it's going to be a great, things are going so well, you're thinking Trump was describing your, your, your 2024. Uh, so, you know, you've, you've done a lot. You wrote this book. But let me ask you, and I can't imagine how much work it is to write a book and how much work it is to put together a conference. And that, you know, but that, but writing a book has got to be, a, you know, a lot more work. So what was your inspiration? I mean, there's plenty of books on deposition out there. I mean, your good friend, Philip Miller, and he's got one. And I've seen... You know, Roger Dodd's got one. And so what made you, you know, you believe that you had to write a book on depositions? Well, our, it, it's been years now. I don't know exactly. 10 to 15 years ago when I started trying out this methodology that the deposition is the trial. Not it's a discovery deposition and then the trials later. But this deposition, it is the trial as if the judge and jury is in the conference room with us. And I started dabbling with it. And that, I'll be honest, that became because of a series of failures, right? That developed on a series of failures. Going to trial, it didn't go right. Why? The deposition video clips weren't solid because the exhibits weren't used in depositions because you name it, right? You go down the list. It didn't go right. Why? Or that deposition, when we reviewed the transcript, we didn't get the video clip. We didn't get the hit. We didn't get it nailed down. Why? It's because we didn't go in with the depositions, our trial methodology. And so 2013, 14 is the time period where we started this methodology that the deposition is the trial. And we started developing it and it started working and we started doing it more and it started working better. Then we started perfecting it. Then we started using new tools and techniques that are in the book and it got better. Then we started trying cases with it. It started, the results started to skyrocket and it just bolstered. And then after you got a great big verdict, what happened? Then all of a sudden the next 10 cases settled for unbelievable results and the deposition video clips were being used for negotiations. And then we got a bigger verdict and it just kind of snowballed until we perfected this methodology that has not been taught before, that has never had a book written about it before. And when, when godfathers of deposition, my closest and dear friends and mentors, Mark Kozarowski and Philip Miller, when they stand up and say, nobody's done this before. Satch created it. I've been with him all these years as his mentor, watching him develop it. And he's the first one to ever create this methodology, develop it, teach on it, and write a book on it. Here we are. I'm not trying to say that we're the first ones to say the words deposition or trial at all. And those aren't my words. That's the professions. I am the first one to develop the methodology, put it into a technique that I can pass on and put it into a book that anybody can go read and start doing these techniques themselves. 
And so that's the circle of passing it on that uh, is so inspiring. Because, you know, one of the things I like to ask folks about, because we all, you know, work our asses off in whatever it is we're doing within our profession and trying to accomplish great things for, for a variety of reasons, for our communities, for our families, for ourselves, you know, for our egos. I mean, let's be honest. We all, if you don't have an ego, I don't know how you'd be a trial lawyer, right? If you're, not, if you're not inclined to greatness, to do something big. And so let me ask you, what would you say is your greatest accomplishment professionally? Well, I will tell you that has evolved over time and it is constantly changing. But in the last month, it has become apparent to me because I've been getting the, the biggest accomplishment in, the, in my career is the I'm getting all of this feedback from lawyers all over the country saying, I learned how to use this technique from you. I did it. And they send me the video clip and then they tell me the results by trial, by verdict or by settlement because of the technique. And that passing it on and how it's now hundreds of lawyers or thousands of lawyers are using these depositions, our trial methodologies to get better results for their clients. I will just tell you, I think that is the, the biggest thing. That is uh, the most fulfilling um, event and the greatest thing that we've accomplished so far. And that's, I will tell you that that's developed and built upon all of the individual clients that we have represented all these years and tried to get these great results for. And you've heard my, you've heard my talk about how our, us and our clients develop this trust and relationship where I learn as much from them as they learn from me. And sometimes even more, I learn from them. And so I want to say the foundation are all these clients that have trusted me in the, all these years and my team, but passing it on and seeing those results come back across the country. That's it, Dan. Yeah. I, uh, I can relate to what you're saying because, you know, I get some emails occasionally. I got one the other day about a, uh, an attorney out of, you know, Detroit, Michigan, where I'm from, who had his first civil rights verdict and got like nine and a half million dollars on a, you know, against the Dearborn Police Department. Actually, we're going to do a case analysis on it in the next few weeks. And another friend of mine who does civil rights work in Detroit is going to host it. And so it's a ability to, you know, they bring these two lawyers together in the same community who don't know each other, who are doing the similar type of work. And so now they'll become friends and then you, know, you never know, collaborate on cases and whatnot. So it's a great thing to be able to be in a position to help people and then, you know, and to bring people together. That's, that's always got me going. Um, but let's look at the opposite side. And you're doing a great job at it, Dan. I, I want to share my, my thoughts on that. I believe that you are doing the single best trial lawyer education in the history. And you, you really are doing a fantastic job. You, you've changed and revolutionized what, what we do and our ability to pass it on. Uh, and I don't, that's, I know I have to, I be, I'm blessed to be in a circle of great trial lawyers all the time. Uh, some of the best trial lawyers in the country uh, texting me this morning and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm getting a text message from these great trial lawyers. But I'm in those circles, Dan, I know that that, that sentiment is shared across this country. And so you are doing a great job. And I want to, I pray you keep doing it. I appreciate that. And it's, it's, it's the foreseeable future. I'm trying to, I always think, you know, maybe I just get this thing so dialed in. I don't have to be 12 hours a day, but it's like Panish told me, you gotta, you just gotta do harder, better. Cause it doesn't get easier. <laughs> Whatever success well, you have, he's one of the best. And there's just more pressure, you know, and it's internal pressure to, you know, forget about the external one. It starts with internal pressure. Like I gotta be better. I gotta, you know, I got to, how more can I make this event so that people get more out of it? They get more learning, more relationships, more fun, more connections. So, but it's, it's, you know, it's a constant process, just like trial is of creativity and execution. And then looking at the results, making adjustments. But uh, what would you say, what would you say is, you know, nobody starts at the top and you said that, you know, the book was came out of a, a series of losses, but let me ask you, what would you say is your most painful or, you know, the one that, one that still sticks with you, loss of your career? That you still, you know, and also kind of, you know, I think they also drive us to, to do better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, early on in my career, uh, Romanda Gilliard was my client. And the, the OBGYN clinic failed to let her know that she had cervical cancer. And she went in for the testing, 
but they never told her that it was positive and that it grew in that period of time to the point that she had to have a total hysterectomy. And she was a young lady, and so she was unable to have children. And so we're trying that case in, down here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, against a Hall of, Hall of Fame defense lawyer who does medical negligence. And uh, during the trial, it was no offer case. So we're, we're doing all that stuff to get ready for trial. But I will tell you, that was in the time period before my methodology. It was. It was before I was able to do what everything I teach now. And so I'm in there trying to figure it out, which way's up. Uh, and on day three of the jury trial, the defense lawyer offers of $750,000. So, oh my gosh, I went to the clients. We talked about it. And they said, what do you think, Satch? And I said, I don't know. I feel good about this trial. I think we should turn it down. And they said, we trust you all the way. And they, we turned it down. The next day, they offered a million dollars. I went with the clients. And they said, we trust you, Satch. You know, whatever you say, we're going to do. And I said, I think we should turn it down. And so on day five, it went to the jury and they deliberated for five hours. And in Arkansas, you have to get nine out of 12 to get a plaintiff's verdict. And we got eight. And so we got a defense verdict on that case. And this family, they were from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, but the event happened in Arkansas, and so uh, they uh, they got zero, right? They got zero, and we lost two hundred and some odd thousand dollars of litigation expenses. Just this huge loss, and I was in shock that night. I was in shock, and so I, I we did have this little powwow after the verdict, but I don't really remember it. And I woke up the next morning, and I was just crying. Four thirty in the morning, I wake my wife up, Cody, and I'm crying. And I said, "Honey, I've just I've failed miserably," and I. I have failed either way. However you want to look at it, I've failed. I failed if I didn't settle the case for a million or more, like because I didn't really push the negotiations like I should have. I was so determined to get that verdict. Or I failed because we got a defense verdict. Either way, it is a ultimate failure for Ramanda and her family. And I, I was in such shock yesterday. I, I know I said I'm sorry, but I did not let them know that I failed them and I how apologetic I am. So she's like, call them. So I called them. It was like five in the morning and they were flying out that morning. So they were at the airport and I said, can I come see you? And they said, come on. And so I drove up to the airport and they were still in there and they had their luggages and I got down on my knees and I, I was crying and I told them how sorry I was and I had failed them. They said, stand up, Satch. And they both gave me this huge hug and they said, we trusted you before. We trusted you during and we trust you now. And they forgave me, and, uh, and it was just a beautiful moment. But I will tell you, I broke down everything about that case, everything about that case, every moment, every exhibit, every visual aid, every witness, the judge interactions, the defense lawyer interactions, and I did an analysis of my series of failures over that two-year period of litigation that cases, and I created a system to overcome and make sure that those things don't happen again. Now, unfortunately, they did happen again some, right? And so I had to improve again and again and again. And it's those failures. I had a $3.2 million offer on the table on another case for Terry, who's our client, Terry Polino. And the Friday before the Monday jury trial starts, the judge grants the defendant's motion for summary judgment. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, we appealed it. Went, went through the appeal process and lost. And Terry Polino was paralyzed from here down. And so I'm telling you, I got real losses on my hands, Dan. I don't want to walk away from it. Uh, I want to look right at it and tell you that I have let people down. And now I love those folks and they love me and we went through those failures together. And I had a great relationship with Terry and her husband, Eddie, uh, all those years. And she was one of my first clients too in 2009. Uh, but, uh, it's uh, it's real, you know, and we, I remember to this day, we spent $268,000 in litigation on that case. I've been practicing for three years, Dan, and lost $268,000. So, I mean, I've also been to that point where I, I had to walk into my wife and say, honey, I, I don't know if we're going to make it. We've, we've borrowed money from one bank to pay the other bank off. Unless I could find another bank to loan me some more money. I don't know how we're going to do this. We just took a $268,000 hit. I'm 29 years old. 
Um, you know, so those are real life get down in the trenches. And I'm just being brutally honest with you. You know, we talked about that. I asked jurors to, jurors to be brutally honest with me. I'm being brutally honest with you, Dan. It wasn't all so sunny and shiny early on, those taking those hits. Same thing there. I got back up and I broke down all of my failures in those cases. I apologized to those clients, broke down those failures and started developing a system to make sure it didn't happen again. And that's how, that's the foundation we start developing and building these methodologies to where my previous failures, they don't happen again. Well, speaking of, you know, working hard to prevent failures, losses, and to get better, what kinds of things do you do on a, a daily basis to, to get better at your craft? Yeah, well, I start out each morning in quiet time, uh, in prayer, some uh, start out in the Bible, and uh, I believe that's that's the foundation. I think that that keeps me centered and focused. And then I I really th try hard to stay focused in my role on the team on the big picture of the cases and the big picture of the verdict. And so if I stay focused on that and I don't let myself get pulled into the weeds of a case, it allows me to stay focused on strategy. And, and now, you know, it's, you, you, like, you go from failures to this big gap in there where we're perfecting things. And so I am going to every trial lawyer in the country, asking them for advice, telling them what I'm doing, how do I do it wrong? Early on in my career, uh, I associated uh, Don Keenan on multiple cases and went to trial with Don Keenan in 2009 on a tractor trailer case. And so I just want to tell you early on, I was like seeking, who do I do this with? And I was finding, I went, just, I can't remember their name right now, but I associated other big time lawyers early on in my twenties and tried these cases with them to learn from them and uh, see how they're doing. Associated Charles Allen on depositions. And I give a lot of credit for Charles to Charles Allen because he's one of the first people to teach me how to take a great deposition. So I would associate lawyers. And then I, I went to every AAJ conference. I don't think I missed one for the first 10 years of my career. And I sat on the front row and I took notes. And when I would get home, I would memo it up. And then I'd have a team meeting on how we're going to apply it. And then, of course, back when I started, I felt like that was kind of the only thing going. And so now you've got stuff like what you do, and there's other opportunities out there. But I would go. I went to everything. I remember when Rick Friedman did a Rules of the Road seminar in Las Vegas. I think I was in my 20s. I was on the front row looking up. And I remember Rick Friedman like, oh, my gosh, this guy's a genius. He's written this book. Oh, my gosh. Pat Malone, his co-author, I did one in Chicago. I went to his seminar in Chicago. And I was on the front row. And I remember looking up like, oh, my gosh, Pat Malone. You know, just uh, so I just went to everything. And I, the key there is, though, is that I didn't just go. I sat on the front row. I took the notes. I memoed it up and then applied it to our cases immediately. And so it took me a long time to uh, figure out I have to apply what I'm learning from these great trial lawyers to who I am and my personality to make it work. Um, I'm not kidding you. My first several trials, I took the opening statement from the back of Pat Malone and Rick Friedman's book, Rules of the Road, copied and pasted it, swapped out the plaintiff's names and gave it to the jury. <laughs> and it worked. I got some great verdicts doing that. Uh, and so it took me a while to figure out my, how to combine these great teachings with who I am. Uh, but that didn't come easy. No, and uh, I always say people say, oh, you can't be somebody else, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, but that's almost like their excuse for not going to conferences. Well, I don't want to, I got to be myself. I'm like, well, you only could be yourself. But to get the ideas and concepts from other people and just work them through your brain and practice them, that's how you get comfortable with them. And that's how you can like, quote, unquote, be authentic yourself, even though you're using ideas and materials from others. So we got Vegas coming up in, tw in uh, just a two and a half more months. I think we're about 85 days out. And this will be our third time doing TLU live, and we're doing it at Caesars Palace, so a little more center of the strip this time, and we have a big production coming out. And, you know, we, besides 
you know, I'm so excited because like all the people, like you know, the people you said, the Pat Malones, the Rick from that you know, they're not coming. But you know, in in this world, in my world, like the legends are all coming. You know, we, obviously there's Joe Freed, there's there's you know, my friend, my, obviously my great friend Sean Claggett's coming with his firm and you know, teaching for three days, and my good buddy Nick Raleigh, who I went to the Trial Lawyers College with back in 2005. We were roommates, and you know, known each other almost 20 years now, and. And then Brian, you know, so he's teaching three days with his his group of folks that he's been trying cases with for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And and then Brian Panish, who, you know, we all know who Brian is, who's built a, a mega firm on the West Coast, PSR. And so they're going to be teaching for, you know, three days on their philosophies on thing. And then there's, you know, there's, and then there's, you know, your buddy Joe, I think, I think Joe Freed, and just so many, Randy McGinn and you, and I'm just so excited because there's just so many luminary what i could say like luminaries of the game coming together to to share this knowledge and to give everybody there the opportunity to pick you know because there's eight tracks running simultaneously plus a lot of workshop tracks for small group training but it really you know we all have insecurities and gaps in what we feel that our skill sets are and that's why i kind of developed this mat this big menu so that people could be where they need to be to improve that gap right there in in the process you know in the in their their knowledge base and obviously and always you know i'm so psyched about what you're teaching because so much of what you're teaching is so immediate relevant and that's what i want to talk to you about i know you got three hours on depositions our trial on your you know your philosophy the book you wrote so tell three in those three hours give us a an idea of what you know people will learn if they decide to come listen to you know, to learn from you and instead of all these other great folks. But the great news is, because people always get mad at me about my conferences sometimes, they're like, there's so much great shit to look at, to watch, to learn. I got FOMO. And I'm like, I know, but we record it so you can watch it after the fact so that all this brilliance is not just lost, right? I can't even imagine not recording these, these seminars. I can't, I can't imagine it. Like all the work that you and all these people have put into these presentations, that it would just be for one time, it makes no sense because it's, it's so much work. Like you, you know, you're doing something with Joe and you guys are kind of, you know, are flying back and forth. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but tell us what the depositions our trial block is about. Sure. Well, first, all those names you mentioned, I just uh, can't even believe I get to speak at the same conference with them. And I look up to all of them so much. I mean, my, my brother and dear friend, Joe Freed is a mentor of mine and we're gonna even teach together. And uh, Sean Claggett, we have an 18 wheeler case goes to trial in September and Jeff Hamby's lead trial counsel in our firm. And it's kind of like his first big, huge 18 wheeler case. And so we're getting ready for it. And I said, you know what, let's go out and let's, let's hire Sean Claggett as a consultant on this case and learn from him. And I get, and I've been telling people that and I'm like, wait a minute. I thought people hired you. I'm like, they do hire me. Why would you go out to Las Vegas? I'm like, because we have to learn. We have to get better. So we went out and spent a day with Sean and Jordan. It was awesome. I learned so much and, and they do things so often. So I'm just, I'm a big believer in this. And we did, then we did the big data thing with John Campbell because Sean recommended it. And of course, the other names that you mentioned, I just learned so much from. So it's going to be phenomenal, Dan. What we're going to be doing on our, our uh, three hours on depositions, our trial is we're going to break down and teach uh, the chapters of the book. And we're going to show the examples and the nitty gritty behind it. And so it's a breakdown. It's kind of like a three hour version that complements the book. So I'm, I'm hoping folks will have read the book by that time, come to the seminar, and then we're going to do the application. So if this is the teaching, this is the instruction, this is the philosophy, then we're going to do the application in uh, Las Vegas. So if you really, I mean, literally, I, the agenda for that is the chapters of this book and the breakdown. And so that's what I want to offer uh, everybody coming to see you in Las Vegas. And, you know, we're at the beginning stages of this. It's going to be awesome. I mean, we, I haven't taught that before. I have, in all of my years of teaching and traveling before, uh, I'm going to do a conference for AJ Dan on the book, which I'm excited about in Scottsdale. And then it is in September, September 19th and 20th. That's the first time ever that I have taught the teachings and nitty gritty of this book. And then I'm coming to see you in Las Vegas. And so we're, what I'm trying to say there is that this is new stuff. This really has not been taught before at the level that I'm offering it. 
uh, for the first time. So that's what we're doing on the deposition on trial on the book where that's just me too uh, that day. If somebody wants to get that book prior to, you know, coming to Vegas, how would they go about doing that? www.depositionsartrial.com. Well, it's amazing that that domain was still available. Just like. That's why it's a, it's a oh. blessing. We couldn't believe it. Whenever I told the company, 12.3 Media, I was like, man, it'd be cool if it was depositionsartrial.com is available. And they're like, that won't be available. They called me back 15 minutes and said, we just bought it for $15. <laughs> you know, that's what I, when I came up with this trial lawyers university idea, because you know, yeah. it was like there was a, I was part of the trial lawyers college and they had their very strict philosophy on psycho, psychodrama is the foundation of the whole world of trial. And then, you know, I didn't ever do anything with Keenan like you did, but I know he had a very, very strict philosophy. Like you do it this way or you're a fucking idiot and you get kicked out of my group, period. And so I know that if anybody had a disagreement with Don, they got banned from the tribe. And, uh, you know, I only know. I, got I know. I, I heard. I never heard real story, and I know you don't talk about it because, like, you like to keep it all positive. No. But I know Claggett's story yeah. with him, and I know there's plenty, plenty of stories of those things. And so, but and but then when I started doing these webinars during the pandemic, I just realized for the first time that I mean, which I still, but I mean, not for the first time, but just there's so many different philosophies that every you know everybody's got their philosophy. Nick Raleigh's got his philosophy. Brian Pash has got his philosophy. Uh, Keith Mitnick his and you know, Joe Freed his and you yours and Randy McGinn hers. And so, and everybody's winning, doing it differently. Sometimes they talk about They're their clients. Right. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> Sometimes they talk about money. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they use visual yeah. strategy. They've got visuals all through the opening. Sometimes they just sit there and talk to the jury and connect. But everybody's got their thing. And that's why when I thought, wow, this is more of a university. Because this is all these schools of thought coming together to, you know, really improve our, our world, our, each of our own situations, because that's where we all start with, you know, like, how am I going to get better for whatever the world is? And, uh, and so then I looked, I looked up triallawyersuniversity.com, and by golly, it was available for $9. That was after I spent like $2,700 two months earlier buying caseanalysis.com. So everybody, you know, somebody uh, thought to squat on case analysis and extort money for that. But nobody thought to squat on Trial Lawyers <laughs> University. So it worked out well for me, too. Whew. It's like... It's meant oh, to be. And one of my buddies, because that was back when the time the trial lawyers college was having their, their meltdown. And so one of my buddies that was part of that, he actually had texted one of the guys at trial lawyers college, hey, instead of fighting over trial lawyers college, you should buy trial lawyers university. It's available. And the person ignored his text. A week later, I bought it. I'm like, just look, that was divine intervention because it, it, it would be a different name if it was called anything but trial lawyers university. It just feels like there's no other name that we meant for what we're doing here. Anyways, so that's one block of three hours. And now you got another block of three hours with your buddy, Philip Miller. And my buddy, Philip Miller, yes. he's a good old Nashville boy. And he's a trial lawyer and a trial, but mostly what he's doing now is consulting. And I know he's your, your go-to consultant. You guys got a lot of trials together. Yes. You got one coming up, you know, as we speak. When, when's that next trial yes. going, Satch? Uh, Philip and I have a trial. He's the jury consultant August 26th against RNL Carriers. Uh, we're um, excited to try that case together. And we have another trial, wrongful death, 18 Wheeler case against Kroger Logistics is September 23rd. So we've got two, two trials this year. And uh, I mean, right now it looks as if they're going to trial. So I'm so excited about it. Well, we'll talk about those, those, those battleships to see if it really makes it to trial or not in a little bit here. But what are you and Philip going to be talking about though? What we're going to talk about in Las Vegas are our two by four timelines, how to develop the timeline, how to develop the two by four, how to use the two by four throughout the course of the case, because you have to build the timeline in depositions. So it starts in brainstorming. It starts in the discovery phase. And then, of course, we have to go get the deposition video clips that support the timeline. And then it moves into, we're going to lay a, a, a small intro for the timeline just to put emphasis on it in jury selection. Because what we found that there are tons of jury research is, folks, if you, if you do your focus groups, and we always do an evidence-weighted process. So what I mean by that is we want to say, okay, we showed you 15 things. What was the most influential to you? What was the second most influential? What was the third most influential? 
timeline is always in our top three. Always in the top three. I don't, in every case, we let's say Philip and I worked on 30 cases together, different fact patterns, different jurisdictions, different scenarios. The timeline is always in the top three. That's how important it is. And so in jury selection, when you say, would a timeline help you guys? Yeah. You all like timelines? Yeah. I mean, everybody's like, yeah, show me that timeline. Of course, you don't then because you got a little, it's coming, it's coming. But you want to create that, I want a timeline. Well, as the plaintiffs, we have the benefit of always being the first ones to give them a timeline and a story. Always. So why not take advantage of this system? So we set it up. You like timelines? Yeah. You want to see one? Yeah. Would it be helpful to you? Yeah. And then opening statement, we're the first ones to give them what they want. And they're like, that was good. And so the two by four and opening statement, we are going to break down how to use it. But then you got to get into the evidence. And this is where it's like, golly, I love reading the ingredients of the cookbook and I love tasting it, but how do you cook it, right? There's so many gaps in our profession, Dan, that, that we don't make up the gap. We read the ingredients and say it looks great. We see the result, but what about in the middle? Well, I will tell you that it's got to do with you have to establish that timeline in the evidence through direct examinations. And there's an art to that. And that's what we're going to walk through. And then you mentioned, this came up in something you and I were talking about, but uh, in our last jury trial, Philip was the jury consultant this last summer. It's a wrongful death case, electrocution case. We actually, it was fun. Our, our cross-examination of the corporate defendant was the timeline. We simply set the two by four up that has been rock solid established at that point because at the end of the trial, right, it's over. The jury's kind of like, that timeline is sacred. And so this guy had a choice and it was awesome in front of the jury. He can either concede to this timeline that kills their case or he violates the sacred two by four. So he fell on his sword and agreed with the sacred two by four. So that's what we're going to go through. And truthfully, here's the art to it in closing statement. Don't mention it. We set it up and it just sits there. The work is done. So that's what we're going to Phil and I are going to break down. And, and uh, he is awesome at the strategy of deciding what needs to be in the timeline, how to develop it, how to showcase it, how to use it. Uh, he's the best I've ever seen, quite honestly. So I, I look forward to being able to do that presentation with Philip Miller. Got one more presentation for three hours with our mutually great friend and mentor, Joe Freed. You know how far back Joe and I go? Do you know how Joe and I go back? Tell me. I don't know. We I go don't know. all the way back to 2003, or maybe 2002, because I went to four regional programs before I went to the trial lawyers college because I kept applying and they kept rejecting me. So I figured if I got to know a few people, maybe they'd stop rejecting me. And, you know, fortunately they did and they didn't. So they let me in, but then they continued and somewhat to reject me for 12 years. Sort of, even though I was there, I was like, you're here again. I'm like, yeah, I'm here again. I'm not going away. But anyways, but that's how Joe said, so, so back, I know for sure in 2003, he was one of my instructors when I went to wow. the trial lawyers college out in Wyoming. And, uh, and, then in 2012, when I decided to, like, because Nick Riley invited me to come watch him speak in Las Vegas here, right where I live now, because it was his first Cala speaking gig. And, uh, and so I think I'm here, and I decide that uh, I meet with, somehow Joe, because I met him at 360, and I told him, hey, I, you know, I really want to become a plaintiff's lawyer, because this criminal defense stuff is it's just not going to get me to where I want to go in this life. And and I really don't want to live in Michigan because it's cold there. And, and you know, and uh, he's like, well, if you want to, you know, do plaintiff's work, you got to, you know, speak at plaintiff's conferences. and You got to teach about something that they don't know. And so he kind of talked about it and gave me some ideas, too, to put me on, you know, this path here in a way. And so he's been obviously a very, very, and I mean, he's taught almost every program. I think he was just one program that was in the Panish program that we did that because he had a GTA, Georgia Trial Lawyers Conflict with it. But other than that, he's been, you know, a rock solid, you know, great teacher, mentor, instructor, friend, supporter. He's the one, and, 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 you know, after the first Vegas in 2021, after, you know, I saw him the next week at Crisp, and I'm like, so, so how'd I do? 
of course, I'm all excited about myself. He's like, do you want the truth, Dan? I'm like, oh, darn it. And so, so he was like, overall, it was great, but you got to have food. You got to have great food. You can't beat people pastries in the morning and nothing at lunch. And I'm like, Joe, that's real expensive, though. You wouldn't believe how much they charge for food in these places. He's like, that's a Dan problem, not a Joe problem. So you just figure it out. And so, but it was great advice, and we did figure it out. And so we have great breakfast every, every morning with bacon and eggs for everybody and great lunches and snacks in between and appetizers at the party. So, so we, 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 we figured out the food problem pro- program at TLU. So that was great advice at so many different levels. But um, you, and, you and Joe are teaching for three hours. So what are you and Joe collaborating on? Uh, Joe has uh, just been a blessing. He and his wife, Terry, have been a blessing in Cody and I's lives. And I'm so thankful that Joe was, wrote the foreword to our book, along with John Romano and Dino Colombo. And the fact that those three lawyers and Joe Freed would just do that is just uh, mind-blowing and, and humbling, but it's exciting. Joe, as, as you know very well, and I think most plaintiff's lawyers across the country by now know, I know in the trucking, he is the founder and the developer of the speed trial methodology. First one to ever teach me that, my first time to ever hear that concept was through Joe, and it is amazing. Let's just, it's, I, I'm a believer in it, I soak it up, I now study it, I've tried it, I've failed, I've tried it, I've succeeded, I've developed, you know, I just think it's awesome. And so, Joe and I and our friendship, and we've spoken together for you multiple times now, and we've now learned that we G and Hall. We really go well together. Our teaching methodologies, our personalities go well. We're able to communicate and teach in a way that, that everyone loves it. We've just had these huge turnouts at each one of our TLU events, which I, the only time we've ever spoken together is for you, and it's great. And so, I mean, we're at conferences all the time together, like Nashville. I speak here and he speaks here, though. But the only time Joe and I have come together and talked together is for TLU. And the results are really phenomenal because we just go well together. Our, the way we think just does well together. So he's speed trial methodology. I'm depositions, our trial methodology. So for the first time ever, for you, Dan, and for all the lawyers in the country, we've developed what we've called the perfect combination. Now, it is a work in progress. Joe and I have got to spend some quality time together between now and TLU in Vegas. And we're, we've already got that on the calendars to do. But we are going to develop the perfect combination and create a system and a methodology to combine his speed trial methodology with my depositions, our trial methodology to bring it together for an awesome, awesome product for our clients that trial lawyers can use across the country. And we're going to break that down for the first time ever over three hours in Las Vegas. Well, I'm pretty, I am uh, grateful for that. I know that the people that come and, you know, cause I was just an AJ and, you know, just I'm having conversations with people and some of like, man, I learned so much from this guy. You read this guy named Sat, Sat. I go, Sat Shop? He's like, yeah, man, that guy's great. I'm like, see, that's because uh, I got but it's so good to have be able to like have great ideas and be able to share them because then they have a bigger impact, bigger impact. So let's transition now to Satch Oliver, the trial lawyer. And I really want to talk to you about your philosophy on different aspects of trial, starting with, sure, you know, and the trial, you know, you just mentioned this trial that you just most recently tried was electrocution case. So give us a kind of, you mentioned some facts, but just give us a snapshot of that case so that, to give a little context to what we're about to talk about. Sure. Well, that's a very tragic case where a gentleman, oh, he is uh, walking down the railroad tracks on the way, or, or not even along the railroad tracks, along the side, there's like a little walking path in a rural community in Arkansas. And the, the electric company, there's a, uh, when you have a power line crossing a railroad, it can't have any splices for obvious reasons. They just don't allow it. It's against the rules. There's codes against it. But this company had spliced this 1950s old copper wire three, four times, and it was so brittle, and they just kept splicing it. Well, one, it it should have been replaced with aluminum wire years ago. They kept It never should have had any splices on it per the code. Well, this gentleman's walking along, and a splice fails, comes down, electrocutes him, and kills him. It was a tragedy. Uh, now... 
Some obstacles in the case, I'll tell you, were he had some drugs in his system that the, that the court said was admissible. It's public information. And, th and they weren't the good kind of drugs. Uh, and so, uh, and then uh, he had some issues where he was uh, estranged from his children and his ex-wife actually testified against him. There were some battery issues in the past. It was public record. So we had our challenges in the case. And so there's no doubt about it. However, uh, uh, it was, we thought it was too low of an offer. I think it was a $300,000 offer on the case and I got a $2 million verdict in arguably the most conservative county in the state of Arkansas. So uh, very, uh, very challenging case to try, but uh, hey, we did it and we were thankful to do it. So uh, that's the synopsis, Dan. Right. Now we got the backstory. So getting ready for trial like 90 days ahead of time. Tell us some of your processes to, to, to get ready to stand up in that courtroom. Sure. First of all, you, you have to get your mind set into trial mode. Now, it's one reason depositions in our trial methodology works, that we stay in trial mode more. But here's what I saw myself doing, and I, see, I saw my friends doing <clears throat> because of the way of the world now, where if you try one case a year, or if you try one case every other year, you just gradually, not even intentional, or subconsciously get out of trial mode. So what we have is I have created an intentional system in our firm where we intentionally get into trial mode. And so what does that mean? That means that obviously all of the prep work is done. That, that part's done. Our system is in place. So we're ready for trial. But you have to get up here. So 30 days before the opening statement, our entire team is in trial gear, suit and tie, whatever that is for you. You have to wear trial gear. We're, we're, um, we're going to look like the trial lawyers. Now, one reason to start doing that is because just let's be frank, I'll go three months and not put on a suit and tie, right? So you put on your suit and tie on the morning of jury selection and you get rashed up. You know, you look uncomfortable. Like everybody looks at this guy is like, what in the world? He's scratching his neck. He looks like he's got pimples all over his neck. You know, it's like, what the heck? And the next day you got a rash, uh, you know, just, it just go, unwinds. We're going to knock all that out. My point is, is that we have to be comfortable. So we get in trial mode. Next, we know that this trial is going to last two days, four days, five days, eight days, 10 days, whatever it is. We have to be disciplined and regimented to, to maintain our energy for that time period. So we're going to get on a regimen where I'm eating the same thing for breakfast at the same time each day. I start eating the same thing for lunch. I start doing the same schedule as what we learned the trial judge's schedule is going to be. Because what I found happening to me is that I'd be getting tired on day three of trials in the old days. My Part of my failures I told you about, Dan, is I'd be getting tired. That's because I wasn't getting in shape for the courtroom. So we start getting ourselves ready for that uh, early on, those 30 days before trial, uh, which by the way, here starts in two days for our August 26th trial. So my team already knows it's on the calendar. Trial mode, July 26th begins every day and this regiment starts. Well, here's what happens now. We have a trial starting September 23rd. Right. So we will roll right into that next trial mode. And it is it has forced us because of these new policies and procedures I implemented a couple years ago. We're in trial mode. And when you're in trial mode, the results skyrocket. It's just all there is to it. And so that's our methodology. Now, here's something we're talking about trial mode. I'm not talking about how to get ready for trial. It's completely different. I'm trying to answer your question. Dress rehearsals. On our calendars right now, before two weeks before the trial is a two-day dress rehearsal where the jury consultant, in this case, Philip Miller, is already scheduled, is going to come into town. We're bringing in 24 jurors on day one, and we will do a complete jury selection. I will stand up and do, as if we're in the courtroom, a complete jury selection, and then we will do a complete opening statement. Then Philip Miller does the digestion and the breakdown and the visit with everybody. Then we overhaul it and fix it again. It's already been fixed a bunch now because this is like trial ready. And then we do it again on the second day. Wow. I will tell you, 
I've had I've had lawyers come watch me in trial, almost every trial, right? And they're kind of like, man, you didn't use any notes. Oh my gosh, well, I can't believe that went so smooth. That's because I failed at it two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, when you stand up and you say these words and you interact with fake jurors, mock jurors, two days in a row, it just plugs it in. It's right here. You don't have to go anywhere to get it. You just did it. And so that's why when we get to the to the real courtroom with the real jury, I've already I've already had this conversation. I'm just doing it again. So those are the the processes. Also, next, I think this is essential. I think everybody does this, at least I hope they do. We're going to the courtroom at least a one week out, sometimes sooner than that, and setting everything up. We like to take our own system in. Now, there are some courtrooms that do have better systems than ours, and if we can get it to work with us compatibly, great. But most of the time, what we find is, is that most courtrooms don't have a system as good as ours. And so we're going to go in and we're going to set up our boards because you've heard me teach on this. I say courtrooms there, three board courtrooms, 10 board courtrooms, 20 board courtrooms. I size up a courtroom based upon how many visual aid foam boards we can get in front of the jury. I got to know, is this a three board courtroom or is this a 10 board courtroom? Because it's going to affect how I handle opening statement, direct examinations, cross examinations, and of course, closing argument. And we got to, we got to have all that done before dress rehearsals. These, these, um, practice dress rehearsals, you record these, Satch? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I was telling you. You were asking me about uh, doing a jury selection webinar or something, and I was telling you, me and Philip Miller have, I, I want to say, probably six recorded dress rehearsal jury selections that we've done together. And you can see me fail. Also, by the way, sometimes I'll screw up so badly, Philip will enter, he'll jump up and, and interrupt the whole thing and come up there and teach me in front of the, the mock jurors how to do it right. And I'll ask everybody, could everybody here just kind of erase their minds for just a minute? We start over and they laugh. And then I just try it again. And then Philip will go, no, you know, and you're like, that's not how you do it. And I'm like, okay, show me how to do it. Show me. And I'll do it again. Uh, but we've got all that recorded. We have all of it captured. And I do think it takes some organization, obviously. But uh, it'd be a great webinar sometime, Phil. Uh, well, I was just thinking these next two trials you got coming up, because these are going to be, you know, your best, even for your practices, it's going to be your best work. And so we're going to set up some webinars after that second trial between, you know, that September date and that October date. So that way we get some more great learning, great teaching, and, and that way also help people, you know, see who you are as a trial lawyer, even, you know what I mean? It's one thing to be the teacher, but it's another thing for folks to see the trial lawyer, because I think that's real helpful. And I think what you just talked about is critical because, you know, it's something I do some consulting with people. That's kind of what we do is like, that's what I'm like, that's where I can help you. I can help you with your, you know, your, your, when you get up and, 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 you know, the presentation parts of it and the voir dire and the, the opening, that's where the most value is and doing it. The people that don't do it, it just surprises me. And, and lot, most people don't do that. Most people just think about their voir dire. They talk, they, they talk to themselves about it, but they don't get up and practice prior to, you know, with the mock jury prior to the, uh, to the trial. But I think that's critical because I've heard it said that the greatest improvements take place between your first and second attempt. And, the, you know, the coaching in between, that's the greatest improvement. Obviously, you keep practicing, you're going to make more improvements, but just not as significant. It's just doing it one time, you'll get significantly better. But now let's move to the trial. Voir dire. What is your, you know, when you, in, in, in this particular case, so when you first stand up there, tell us about what's going on with you and, and your, your first, you know, connections, your first words to the jury. Does it, you know, and is it pretty much similar, very the same every time, or does it change every time? It's generally very similar, but I will tell you right now, I don't do this big introduction. This is not my style, okay? And just because I've done it so long. I mean, I'll say something like, hey, good morning, my name's Satch. Let's jump in here. And then we, we have a very, very simple visual chart. We have a simple visual aid chart that says free speech zone. And so I don't know. I learned that by reading somebody's book, and it was phenomenal. I can't remember who right now. I'd love to give them the credit. But either way, 
Maybe it was Keith Mitnick. Maybe it was Rowley. Somebody out entered the free speech zone, learn how to do it. And I just go straight to the free speech zone. We talk about free speech and how you can say anything that's on your mind right now. And then I roll into brutal honesty. And this is where I start to tell stories about basically myself and the concept to teach the jury what it means to be brutally honest. And so I, I talk about how, for example, I've got children, Reese and Reagan, and let's say that they don't like the way that Aunt Mary Lou's food tastes. Well, I tell them, but you can't be brutally honest, girls. You have to take a bite of it to be polite, and she's going to ask if you like it, and you're going to say yes. You understand me, Risa? You understand me, Reagan? Yeah. That's not what this is here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to be brutally honest. For example, if you don't like my belt buckle, you just say so. You don't like my cowboy boots? You don't like cowboys in general? It's okay to just tell me, okay? Because that's who I am, but it's okay to be brutally honest. Are you guys okay with being truly brutally honest and telling me you don't like the way it tastes, you don't like these boots, you don't like this belt buckle? And so you see how we're going to then work through it. And then same thing with the biases. I got, I got attacked by a German Shepherd. Really, I did. My neighbor, PJ, uh, growing up, and I tell everybody about the biases. And let me talk about biases here. And I just tell the story. When I was a little boy, when I got home from school, every day my dad had me saddle up a horse. I had to ride down the dirt road to the next farm. Well, I had to go past PJ's house. And there was this large, white German Shepherd in the back of this old truck that didn't run. And every day that dog would jump out of that truck and run up the dirt road like he was gonna kill me and my horse. And every day me and my horse got anxiety about it, got PTSD probably about it, every day, right? And so I got to where I had this fear and phobia of these big German Shepherds. So, and then I tell that story you see to say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, if this case was about a German Shepherd biting somebody, do you think it would be fair for me to be on the jury when I already think that dog did it? Everybody's like, no, right? So I'm, I'm taking a real story. And so I just do that with each concept and versus, hi, everybody, let me tell you about Satch Oliver and what I'm about, where I'm from, and how I'm about, 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 they, they turn off. Ugh. Here they turn on because I need to know about this concept because he's about to ask me questions about it. And so the deeper we get into this jury selection and we use stories about ourselves to teach the concept and we usually make it funny and fun and the jurors start realizing that was helpful. You told me that story. It helped me. You asked me questions about it. Then they get more into it and it just snowballs more positively. That German Shepherd stuff, that's, that's so interesting that actually happened to you because that's like right out of Don't Eat the Bruises, you know, you know, Keith Mitnick, Keith right? Mitnick. He talks about the German Shepherd and, you know, the, you know, once we get into the evidence stuff and, you know, and, and so it's just it's so parallel. It's, it's, you know, anyways. Uh, and I love his book, Keith's book. Oh my gosh, it's fantastic. Yeah, it is a great book. It's the, it's the most popular book the trial guys ever has pr published, I, I believe. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. So I can see it. It's no, so it is good. great. I mean, if you don't have your plans, Larry, you don't have it. Don't Eat the Bruises. That's just, it, it, my, it blows my mind. It blows my mind. I take it with me to trial. I will say I've got it marked up. I've got it, I've got it indexed and I take it with me to trial. It's that good. Is that good. How do you talk about, how do you talk about sympathy in that courtroom? Yeah, I don't deal with sympathy at all. I don't talk about it at all. I don't want, you know, we just don't deal with it. How about? And it's because it's just a non-issue to me. We never ask for that. We don't want it. We don't have anything to do with it. And so what happens, this is my opinion. I'm not trying to say anybody else is wrong, right? This is my opinion and how we're doing it because we've tested it so much. People are like, they, like what are you bringing that up for? Uh, it's a very strange thing. And then when the defense jumps up there and they talk about sympathy, they're like, what are you talking about? They got killed, you know, or, or they're paralyzed. What are you? And so I don't know. I just, uh, we don't talk about sympathy in jury selection, Dan. Good to know. How about the burden of proof? We do talk about burden of proof, uh, and I'll just tell you that what I'm about to say is a little bold and a little crazy. You've heard me teach this before, but it works. Man, does it work. So we do the more likely than not. We do the what the difference is, and we have a chart, a burden of proof chart, and it's got the more likely than not is 51%, and then it has clear and convincing that is, that is a little more than that, and then it has beyond a reasonable doubt that's 98%. And so... 
Uh, the cases that we're doing, primarily trucking cases, punitive damages generally is involved in these cases. Most of them they are. And so what we do is we say, all right, ladies and gentlemen, the law says more likely than not 51%. Here's what that means. Are y'all comfortable with that? And of course, we generally get we, the yes. Some people will say no, and we go down that route of maybe asking them to step off the jury. Most of the time, people say, hey, I'm, I'm okay with that. I said, well, let me ask you something. How many people here would feel more comfortable if I brought you the evidence so that it was clear in your mind? How, 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 how do you feel about that? So that it's clear in your mind. And of course, they say, what do you mean? Is that, is that a little better than more likely than not? I'm like, yeah, you got probably versus clear in your mind. Which one do you like better? And everybody says, clear in my mind. Uh, that's, that's easy. Uh, that's easier for me. I was like, okay, even though the law says more likely than not, you guys sound like you like it to be clear in your mind. Yeah? How many of you would like me to bring you the evidence so that you can be convinced when you're in deliberations that our side is the right side? I'd like to be convinced. Yeah. I mean, if I'm standing up here and delivering this case to you in a way where you're not convinced, we ought to lose. How do you feel about that? They're like, yeah, I agree. If you don't convince me, you're going to lose. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's just do this. I'll promise you this. I'll bring you this case to where it's clear in your mind and you're convinced our side should win or I'm asking you to not vote for us. You down with that? Yeah. Let's go around the room. Clear, convinced. Clear, convinced. Clear, convinced. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then, of course, there's a whole chapter in the book, and there's a whole point of this where I teach everybody, and that's why you see in our deposition video clips, clear and convincing. So what I'm, well, here's an example. What we used to do is, is it more likely than not the light was green, and we do all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that stuff's not good and you can do it. That's outdated. Now, what you do is say, was it clear in your mind the light was green? Yes, the light was green. You're standing there. Yeah, you saw it with your own eyes. You're convinced it's green. I'm convinced. Boom. Now we bring all the evidence so that it's clear and convincing in the juror's mind. And we just do that with each witness over and over and over. And then clear and convincing slams the door on more likely than not. And then you use Keith Mitnick's thing in closing argument. A doubt is not an out. I've got a slide just like his. I stole it from him. It was great. A doubt is not an out. Ladies and gentlemen, y'all know this. A doubt's not an out, right? I went on more likely than not, but how many of you feel like we brought you the evidence where it was clear in your mind and you're convinced? I'll take a head nod right now. Of course, the defense objects at that point. You can't ask the jury to do a head nod, even though they're all doing this right here. You betcha, man. So I, I'm just trying to, this is how we're doing this clear and convincing, and it's working, all right? This is new. I'm not trying to say that it's scientific. I haven't done any. This is just, this old cowboy research right here, Dan. You haven't done a John Campbell Big data study on clear and convinced. This is just your intuition. No, but we should. Get a cowboy. Yeah, we well, should. We're going to see it on your, uh, we're, we're, we're going we're to do some a couple webinars after that second trial. So I'm not sure the date. We're going to find some dates on that calendar as soon as those are done. Perfect. And then we're going to saddle up, as you say, and we're going we're gonna to see some actual Satch Oliver <laughs> in action. So I'm, I'm very Perfect. stoked about that. In fact, I always thought it was a, be a when you do your next ones, if I could ask you just to use really good video so that way we can use it and splice it and put it on TLU On Demand to have Satch Oliver's voir dire school on TLU On Demand. That's the next move, Satch. So just let you know where we're going here. We've got it. Our evolution of teaching. It's to talk about money. Because you got, how do you talk about money in, in, you know, in a case like this when you got a wrongful death? Sure, sure. So... We're going to talk about, and in, in what I call the weave, the culpability and the damages together in that story, okay? So, for example, let's talk about in, in jury selection, we do it like I think most lawyers do. We talk about how the you, you insert the damage. Pain and suffering equals money, or death equals money. And so we find out who, can't, who cannot award money. We use award in jury selection, and we don't use it anywhere else for X damage. You know, who's got a problem with that? We do the scale of one to 10. So that's how we start talking about it in jury selection. Just 
wanting to find out, like, I object to giving $10 million for the loss of an arm. Whatever, all right? That's what we need to know in jury selection. But it starts that people thinking, huh, loss of an arm, money. All right, that's what I'm going to have to be figuring this out, okay? I just want them to start thinking that, and I'm looking for people who have objections. Otherwise, I'm just planting those seeds. And you can see people. I've never thought about this before. You see that look, right? And so, all right, great. We're just planting seeds. Now, in opening statement, we're going to do the brief intro. Then we're going to do the timeline. And then we're going to do the hook. And that's how we do it. Very brief intro, timeline, hook. And it's not until the hook that we mention money because we've now done the we, the culpability. So the 18 Wheeler company ignores the fact that they've caught him on his cell phone six times, 90 days before the wreck. On the night of the, occur on the, night of the wreck, at midnight, he's going 71 miles an hour through a construction zone that is supposed to be 40 miles an hour. He goes past 13 barrels. He's on his cell phone going to foxyshazam.com. Traffic is stopped ahead. What happens? Boom. Takes out a family in an RV on their way to Thanksgiving. That RV folds up like an accordion. And there's two special needs kids inside. Mama's driving and crushed and she'll never walk right again. By the grace of God, they're not all dead. And ladies, ladies and gentlemen, for purposes of restitution and reparations, your verdict should not exceed $500 million. That's a lot of money, but it's four family members. And think about all the wrongdoing they did. Let's get to work. So some version of that in that hook right there. Now, notice I say, let's get to work. I'm not even done with the opening. I said, now we got to go. I got to give you a preview of the investigation. We did an intro. We did the timeline. I did the hook. Now, here's a preview of the investigation. And this is where we prove the timeline through the documents and maybe one video clip and through the, uh, the exhibits. And so that's how we're going to do the money part in opening statement. And then in closing argument, money does come up oftentimes in different times during the testimony, but not as much, right? We're talking more about the ingredients that equal the money in the testimony. And then we want to put things in context in closing argument. And so what do you do when you put things in context is I like to say the longer the duration of the injury or permanency of the death and that duration of that harm, that needs to turn into the amount of money. How bad is the injury? Is it forever? Is it permanent? Is it with every step? Is it every sit down the rest of your life? Is it every time you pick up your grandchildren? So ladies and gentlemen, how bad is it? The worse it is, it has to equal the money, okay? And then we talk about how bad it is. So the duration, how bad it is, which leads into permanency, and then the effects on your life. The more effects it has on your life, that equals the money. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, your verdict should not exceed $500 million. So, so that's how we do it. I've heard that done so many awesome ways by different lawyers and different ways than the way that we do it. Uh, remember what I told you early, Dan, I sat down, I listened for, from the best 50 lawyers in the country, and I went back and I duplicated what they did, and I got mediocre results. The day that I started taking what they do and applying it to who I am is the day that our results went through the roof. And that's what I want everybody listening to this podcast to do. You know, if let's say you learn three things today while talking to you and I. One thing from you, one thing from me, one thing from both of us. Well, you got to apply that to who you are. If you just go duplicate what Dan and Satch do, you're going to get really good results. You go take what Dan and Satch do and apply it to your heart and soul and personality, you're going to get phenomenal results. It's you know, with all the learning and stuff from all the folks and uh because one thing I'm you know, doing right now is building a tool to transcribe all these videos, both all these live lectures and all these webinars. And so that way they can all be indexed. So that way it's like, you know, jury empowerment. And then you could like listen or, you know, get to the right place to be able to watch a whole bunch of great lawyers do their jury empowerment closing or, you know, the money part. 
you know, I mean, the damage is part because everybody does a little bit different. And, you, and then when you hear something that really resonates, you're like, oh my God, I'm doing it like that. Or you hear something like, that doesn't really fit me. And so it's going to be, I'm, I'm super stoked because this is right around the corner. And just like you have your book, by definitely by the time Vegas, like this new platform will be much more refined. So I'm really looking forward to that. As far as the other topics in voir dire in this, in this wrongful death case of this young man that we talked about, or this father, not, I don't know how old he was, but the father and husband that was estranged, Give us an idea of some of the other case-specific issues in, in this case and how you addressed them. Well, that case was a little unique because our judge, right before we started doing jury selection, despite our dress rehearsal, said, Mr. Oliver, I've decided that you only need 15 minutes for jury selection. So that particular case was very challenging. And I didn't know that was going to happen until right before it occurred. So I had to, on the fly, narrow down what I thought was going to be about a two-hour jury selection in about 15 minutes. Now, I did get the judge to give me a few more minutes because I tried to say, hey, if I do a good job here and we're getting good results, would you give me a few more minutes? If I'm not, just shut me down right away. So he said, hey, you're doing a good job. I'm going to give you a few more minutes. So let's say I got 30 minutes that this particular jury selection was very challenging, I'll just tell you. Um, and so, however, I will tell you that uh, if you haven't heard the dollar bill, this is the case where we used the dollar bill uh, in jury selection to start getting people to thinking about wrongful death because we had a client who had drugs in his system, had a checkered history of convictions and felony and battery. Uh, his life had, had been in the trenches uh, for a long time. And so it was in jury selection, we thought we, gotta, we better get this out and get people thinking about it right now. And so in that particular case, even though I had to cut a lot, uh, I decided to finish jury selection with uh, the, the dollar, the, the $100 bill. And I'll just tell you what that is I'm, if I have one with me. So ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let me get here. Oh, yeah. I was at uh, our cowboy church a few weeks ago and the preacher held up a nice, crisp $100 bill. And he said to the congregation, how much is that worth? And of course, everybody said, what? Somebody tell me. And the jury says, it's $100. And that preacher, he said, but you know what happened to that $100 bill? Is it, it started living its life. And in his teenage years, things didn't go very well. And that, that $100 bill had got some tears in it. And then you know what? In his 20s, the world turned on him, or he turned on himself. That, that $100 bill, it got crunched up, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't even look the same anymore. And then that $100 bill in his 30s, it's was torn, it's battered, but it actually found itself in the mud. And life stomped on it, and he stomped on it. And here, that $100 bill is now 45 years old. It's been beaten, it's been battered, it's been stomped on, it's been in the trenches. And it's at the end of its life. How much is that $100 bill worth now, even though everything it's been through? Tell me, I want to hear somebody say it. $100 in it. That's what they'll say. And don't you know that that's how our Lord sees the value of life? Is that no matter what you've been through, it is as valuable as the day it was born as the day that it dies. And in this trial, you're going to have an opportunity to think about the value of life. And even though somebody gets beaten on and in, down in the mud and in the trenches and their life is taken away wrongly by a corporation, we're going to have to have a hard talk about the value of that life. That's what we'll be doing over the next three days. You all right with that? And then we go poll the jury. Are you okay with that discussion? 
Are you okay with being on a jury? Where we're going to be talking about the value of life. So, anyway, that's what we did on that one, Dan. All right, let's get to opening statement. Opening statement, kind of give us your, uh, you know, your philosophy, your approach, and, you know, and, and, and in this case, in your cases, what are you trying to accomplish? How are you accomplishing it? Yeah, so I think we've talked quite a bit about that already with, with, with you know, we just want to get the, our client's story out there. And we've got a methodology for doing that. I, I think that's the most important thing. We want to tell our client's story in a way that it sticks in the jurors' minds so well that our, the jurors can tell our client's story in deliberations. And so we basically do that with a, a brief intro, the timeline, the hook, the investigation. We put things in context, learn that from Keith Mitnick. That's basically, you don't say here are the defenses. You put things in context and take out the defend, the defenses, and then we bring it to a conclusion. That's the, that's the bones of our opening statement consistently over and over and over. That's what we do. All right. But now let's talk about order of proof and you know, putting on your case. In this, in this electrocution wrongful death case, tell us about the, the decision of who you, who you come out of the gate with. Who do you start with in this case? Yeah, most of the cases we see, we're going to pick a witness who can establish the entire timeline as the first witness. And in, a lot of times it's our longest witness, maybe 45 minutes on the stand, which is long to me uh, in today's environment. But in, in, that, in this particular case, that was an expert and in our last tractor-trailer verdict, it was a tractor-trailer safety expert. In this case, it was an uh, electric power company expert. And so that first witness establishes the two-by-four, the timeline and the testimony. That's usually where we're going to go first. Then usually we come in second with the corporate defendant, the corporate rep, 30B6, by video. So live witness to open us up, expert on the witness stand, establish a two-by-four, and then a corporate rep by video that now it's going to introduce, it's going to confirm the timeline, it's going to introduce culpability, and it's going to start weaving in the damages as well with the corporate representative. We got to get that culpability and wrongdoing on the background behind the two by four timeline. And so then it, that's how we get started, Dan, and every case is different. That's generally how we get started. Where we go from there, uh, I generally, most of the cases that we try have multiple plaintiffs, not all of them, but a lot of them do. And so we're going to start interweaving in our lay damage witnesses and our plaintiffs interwoven with culpability witnesses. So if it's expert, established timeline, corporate rep, introduce culpability, wrongdoing, affirm the timeline from the corporate defendant, and then some layer of damages a lay damage witness, maybe then a plaintiff, then maybe the truck driver or the wrongdoer at the plant or where the, the, the actual person who, who did the wrongdoing and the engineer, for example, in a different type of case. And then you're going to interweave the safety department with the lay damage witnesses and the plaintiffs. So then if you have multiple liability culpability experts or you have multiple damages experts, we're going to interlace them throughout so it's culpability, damages, culpability, damages, interwoven throughout. And then every case is so different, I don't have a strict model on the order of those. It depends on, but I generally start strongest first and build a sandwich. So who's, who's the strongest liability expert, culpability expert? They're going to go first. And then it's kind of like we do at our live auctions, but... It, who's our who's our strongest? They go first. Who's our second strongest? They go last, and then we build in the middle, and so that we're, we build it that way. And we generally do that with d damages experts, liability experts, lay damage witnesses, and plaintiffs. Our strongest plaintiff goes first. Our second strongest plaintiff goes last. So we just do that, and you build that order of proof. Of course, once you're done with all that, you shake it all up, start over. You just keep perfecting it. You know, I forgot to ask you on the opening statement a couple of questions that I think people often wonder about, and that is, how much do you go into your client's damages, injuries? We know this was a death case, but, you know, when cases aren't death and they got multiple types of injuries, how much time do you spend on that in opening? 
however much time it takes to tell that story, I just interweave it with culpability. So it's not, I guess that's the only difference I want to say. That's why it's hard for me to say. Like, for example, we don't do one third of the opening is in liability. One third is in causation. One third is in damages. That weighs out. That's the old methodology. I mean, that may come back. I mean, 10 years from now, I may come back and say, Dan, here's how you do it, buddy. But right now, with today's jurors and the modern jury trial, that's not how you do it anymore. And so it's, it's interwoven. So it's culpability with how that caused the damage. So I introduce the damages one at a time. I, our next jury trial, where the client has injuries head to toe. I mean, my goodness, from head injury to broken ribs, to spleen injury, crushed pelvis, uh, her femur was snapped, uh, pins in her wrist, okay? So we're gonna talk about not sleeping, watching pornography, before you start driving a tractor trailer. That's bad, isn't it? Remember, that's bad. And you know what that causes? That causes a broken wrist, and I'll pop up an x-ray with screws in it. And that causes somebody not be able to carry their kid or the grandkid. All right, then, so I'm, I'm simplifying this, Dan, but then you talk about, all right, three felony conviction, convictions within three years of the hire, and these convictions, they're not good. You wouldn't let them babysit your kids. Uh, but they hired him anyway. You know what that causes? Yeah, that causes a permanent brain injury. And then we have a visual aid anchoring to the permanent brain injury. And so then we break down the culpability and we do that slowly through the telling the story. And so this is where it's kind of like you got a mirror and you got a sequence and every case is different. Your culpable acts with the damage, the different damages. And in our case, you got multiple plaintiffs generally. Most of the cases I try multiple. And so I then stair stack those plaintiff's damages and interweave it with the culpability of the corporation down to the truck driver on those cases. Man, I can't wait to watch the, your, your, your practice videos when we do that, you know, after you go to trial and get your verdicts. I think that's going to be just so, just so helpful to so many people. Let me talk about money now. I mean, do you mention the number in the opening? And if you do, where do you mention that? And, if you, and do you mention a specific number or do you give the folks a range? We met, we mention a specific number, and we do it in the hook. And so you heard my outline already. We mentioned it in the hook. And then as we're telling the story and during the investigation phase, we reference back and we say, and that's part of the judgment. And that ain't right. And that's part of the verdict. And that's part of the $300 million. And that's part of the verdict. And that's part. And, and ladies and gentlemen, this might be part of $100 million of the $300 million verdict. This might be, and so we reference it with those, what I call toss-aways throughout. And then I probably, depends, I've done it both ways. Every time's a little bit different. If we do the solid anchor in the hook of the dollar amount, and then we reference it at an, another three times throughout the opening, I'm probably not going to say it again at the end of the opening at all. It's done. You, and it's, this is where I teach positive repetition versus despicable repetition. I've, I've, I've found I've gone too far. And so we want to stay with positive repetition. Got it. Positive repetition. All right. Uh, let's cross examination, especially of experts. You know, what is your, you know, how do you, your approach and philosophy on that and how you use your depositions or trial methodology to set that up? Sure. Well, I will tell you it's a lot of fun, but I'd like to pick that one thing that you want the jurors to focus on and do it and do it awesome. So our cross-examinations are short, generally 15 minutes or less of the defense experts. So the, think about this, the defense lawyer does, a, they're almost always live, a live direct examination of their expert and they take, they don't do the Joe Freed speed trial methodology. They do it old school, they take forever, they take 45 minutes, hour and a half, I've had them go two hours, right? And then we stand up and let's say it's that one thing. So for example, that last jury trial, there is a rule that says you cannot have a splice 
on a power line over a railroad. They had four splices on this power line over the railroad. That's our one thing that we wanted to do. And so our cross-examination of this <coughs> power company, <coughs> their expert, that's it. We stood up. We said, you recognize this is the law. We show the law to the jury. You recognize this is the rule. You say this is the rule. You can't tell them it's not the rule. And if you do, you're a liar. I cannot tell them it's not the rule. Then we show them the pictures and there's four splices, isn't there? Yes. And that violates the law. It violates the rule. True? True. You see, so we get that one thing where they know where to go and then just sit down. That's it. Just sit down. Now, you can do that up to three times if you want. Three times is what I call the magic rule. Pop, 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 sit down. Or like in that case, we just did one. And Philip Miller helped me with that. And he's kind of like, annihilate this guy on one thing and sit down. And we did that. It took me four minutes. So uh, that's, that's our cross-examination thought. Now, we generally, it depends. We don't always depose the defense experts, but when we do, we get that video clip. And uh, our case we just resolved, a tractor trailer case, we annihilated the defense expert, got him to reverse his conclusions and opinions, and shared those new video clips with the defense in an effort to collect policy limits. And so we also see that happen. We'll use those video clips to cross-examine the defense expert. But you know what? A lot of times I find, Dan, now with where we're at in our career, I will pop up on the screen the defense expert's deposition video clip. I'll point to it and I'll tell him in the hi, how are you stage, Mr. Expert, if you disagree with me, in the next four minutes, I'll play the video clip to the jury that shows where you lied. You ready? Question one. Were they ready? They're ready. Like, you know, they're like, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm ready. And so the, this is where, like, for example, this is what we did on the, where, there's nowhere for them to go. That's where I picked that one thing. And we've got the video clip where he's already told us, Yes, that's the law. You can't have splices over a railroad. Yes, those are the pictures. Yes, there were four of them. You know, I've already got the video clips. You see, you see what I'm saying is that Charles Allen taught me that. And he says it's, it's putting the dog collar on. So you tell them, right there's you. I've got your sworn testimony. You know what you said. If you disagree with any of my questions in the next four or five minutes, I'll just play the video clip show the jury where you're lying. That's going like this. <laughs> Dog collar's on. Now you just walk them down the sidewalk. Let's let's move to closing, Satch. How do you bring it all together, and you know to uh, to bring it home, both with your yeah. I uh, just be. I don't think that there's anything special about the way that I do closings. I really don't. I, I think we we build it around jury instructions. The only thing is that all the work's done before closing. Those are my thoughts. It's all done. And so we also do not rehash things. We put things in context with the jury instructions. But if I was going to say the one thing that we do that may be a little unique to others, because I think applying the, the jury instructions, I think that's what every great trial lawyer I've watched how to do a closing argument do. Um, that's not new. One thing we do, with, and this is why I call the courtrooms, a 10-board courtroom, a 10-board, 20-board courtroom, is as we're applying the case to the jury instructions to help the jurors with their decision-making, we gradually turn over the boards that support our case. So I set the courtroom up in this, it's like this half moon with easels, and it's left to right, like we're reading a book. And the opening, the closing is sequenced left to right. And so we start applying the case to the jury instructions. And gradually, I'll turn over those boards. Gradually. 
so that when I'm done with closing argument, the entire case is visually in front of the jury, left to right, and I don't have to go rehash it. I'll say things like, and y'all remember this. Remember when that guy said this? And I just point to that board and I get a head nod. I remember that. And you remember what he said? It's right there highlighted in, in red. Yep. And I just set it up so that when we're done, the entire case is set up and you don't have to do despicable repetition, which is unfortunately something I've been guilty of in the past where I rehash everything. This closing, you talked about how you practice your opening and your voir dire. Do you do a dry run of your closing prior to the closing or is it just part of you by that time? It's part of me by that time the night before closing argument, assuming that's how the trial set up, which most of mine are, I've got a night before where I know we're going to go through it with just the team though. We're not doing a mock jury. Um, as you know, we also do trial observers on our trials. Some people call them shadow jurors. I don't like that word. They're trial observers. We also have our trial observers sometimes involved in that process, but generally it's going to be the jury consultant and my team and we're going to do a little, uh, very rough uh, rehearsal the night before, not a full-blown. Um, it's not as rehearsed, quite frankly, Dan. Right. And you say your team. Who do you take, besides Philip? who's on your trial team coming up in this next trial? Uh, this next trial is uh, trial team nine, and that is Ryan Scott, who's been with me from the very beginning, and just a wonderful gentleman. And he's our legal guru, legal researching. He's a genius. He will handle all of the legal stuff at the bench every time, pre-trial, during the trial, everything. He'll take care of it. He sits on the first pew and has sat on the first pew of every trial I've ever done. Uh, he is wonderful. And then Jeff Hamby will be there as a second chair support role. He'll do anything you ask him to do. He's, he's qualified in every category. He'll be there as support. Then we'll have a, another attorney there as well for backup support. And then we generally have at least one litigation staff team member there as well who is handling and facilitating witnesses, exhibits, visual aids uh, throughout the process. I'm very spoiled, Dan. I hope you know that by now. I mean, my visual aids and exhibits will have a piece of duct tape on the back. They'll be numbered in sequence with my opening statement or direct examination or closing argument so that you can set them up and the piece of duct tape on the back that has the number just goes one, two, three, four, five. So they're already set up and ready to go. So uh, we do our own tech. I run my own computer. I did. I, that's one of my failures. I used to hire somebody. It never went right. Um, and so I just do it myself. Uh, we set it up ourselves. It's not complicated. It's a, a laptop and a HD screen deal. So it's not complicated. Anybody can do it. So uh, that's that's our team. And then of course the jury consultant. Our next, my next two jury trials are Philip Miller. Jeff Hamby in our team's next jury trial is uh, Sean Claggett and John Campbell. Are they is Sean coming down to sit in on the case? And I don't think he's actually coming down. I don't think he's. I don't think he's actually going to be there. But he's doing the, all the prep work and all. And he and John Campbell are doing their thing up too. I don't think they're actually going to be there in the court. All right. And you said Hamby's your second chair. That Jeff Hamby. Well, in this particular case that's coming up, will anybody be doing witnesses except you? No, sir. I'll handle every aspect of the trial. And what's your philosophy on, you know, dividing that stuff up? Because, you know, I hear some, because I, you know, people are, you know, co counsel I, I always believe that the same person should do the voir dire, the opening, you know, and the closing, and usually the direct to the plaintiff, because it's like a th common thread voice instead of, you know, somebody does a voir dire, somebody does the opening. I just, it doesn't make sense. But what, just, I know that you're doing the whole thing, but is that because it's your philosophy that you should be the one voice or, you know, What's your thoughts on that? Well, I've done a little bit of everything, Dan, over the years. And most of my, the cases that I get, a co-counsel has associated me. 90 plus percent of our business is by association. So lawyers from across the country, they get, they get the great case. They're the ones with the relationship with the clients originally. And they associate us on the case. 
And so I am very open to what their wants and needs are. Obviously, I wouldn't have the case but for them. Okay. So I am if I if somebody is, calls me up and says, Hey, I want to associate you on this case, and I'm really passionate about me doing jury selection. I'll say, hey, great, you know, hey, that's awesome. Uh, here's how we do dress rehearsals. I want to make sure that they're willing to do that with the jury consultant, and most of the time they are. And if they're very passionate about it, I'm sympathetic to that, and I'm like, hey, okay, sounds good. So I kind of work that out. Uh, generally what happens throughout the process is the closer we get to trial, the more we figure out what my strengths are, what their strengths are, and where we can best benefit the client, and then we plug that in. We had a very talented uh, co-counsel who knew the clients extremely well and had known them for years, right? It's one of those kind of cases. And he said, I really want to do the direct examinations of, of these clients that I've known for years. And I said, hallelujah, great. And so I did every aspect of the case except for he did the direct examinations of those clients. So I'm very open to that. Most of the time, most of the time, I handle every aspect of the trial Keep in mind how spoiled I am. There's a huge team behind me doing a tremendous amount, unbelievable amount of work, okay? So I don't want to, I am, I am not capable of doing everything in the trial. And I've won, I've been blessed to win multiple trial lawyer awards. The first thing I do is say, this ain't me, it's us. Cl rebuttal argument. You've done your closing. The defense, of course, has their say in it and they want to, you know, undermine, poke holes, create doubts, all the bullshit they do. The rebuttal. Do you, do you have your rebuttal sort of outlined and prepared ahead of time, the structure of it, and you just plug it back in, or is it something organic that just, you know, rises out of you based upon experience and, you know, what the defense does? It's both. I usually have three points of what we're going to say, no matter what the defense says. And it's like the bring it home. Then I have a, a three point. I try to do it in threes. Here's the three things I want them to say. And I don't care what their defense is. Here's the three things of rebuttal and then a, a brief sit down. And when I say brief sit down, it's because it's briefly and then sit down. I am. Um, Philip Miller has been a positive influence in me. I used to be these, do these big elaborate rebuttals and I would sit over there, boy, I'd be taking notes during the defense's closing argument. Man, I'd get up and I'd, ah, I'd, ah, and that guy's wrong. And, and Philip, we have a system in place where Philip can communicate with me during the trial. I can't remember the system, but it really works well. And almost every single trial we've done together, he sends me a message that says, no rebuttal, keep your ass down. I can't do it, of course, but I keep it to like three minutes or less. So, I mean, so there's this balancing act that I'm getting better, but I'll tell you, the older I get, the shorter it becomes. It's just like our height. The older we get, the shorter we get. I mean, there's, there's, kind of, there's, a, there's a parallel there. There's a parallel there. The, the older I get, less is more. Here we go. All right, Satch. Well, I think, I think our time here has come to a conclusion. So people... Got you know want to get in touch with you. How did how did they go about doing that? Uh, call me anytime. I mean, I'm I'm very accessible. My office number four seven nine two zero two fifty two hundred. My cell phone eight seven zero four zero four 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 four. Oliverlawfirm dot com. My email s oliver at oliverlawfirm dot com. Uh, call you. You can give them my contact information. I mean. I just feel like both you and I, Dan, I mean, we, we're very accessible. And if somebody needs something, wants something, I don't care what it is, reach out to me. And uh, I'll, if I can help you, we'll try to figure out a way to do it. All right. And if anybody needs to get a hold of me, my phone number is 248-808-3130. My email is dan at trialloriesuniversity.com. A couple other things I forgot to mention, Sash. So one of my uh, thoughts for this year in Vegas is that you know, there's, I think about these law students, and I was just at AAJ and met a whole bunch of these young folks, and, and I remember being back there and, you know, not having a clue as to what's going on in the world and where my life was going from there. And so my, one of my um, big uh, motivators this year is I'm going to do my best to get 100 law students to Vegas, you know, to really have an effect on the future and, and you know, to give any law student that needs it a scholarship. 
And so if there's anybody that, you know, is a law student, listen to this, or you know law students that might want to come to Vegas, just have them send me an email as to, you know, why they want to come to Trial Lawyers University and why they want to be a plaintiff's lawyer. And, and I'm going to, you know, be a very good likelihood that they'll, they'll get a scholarship. They still have to get themselves there. They still got to, you got to take care of their airfare. And, you know, they got to get themselves there, but I'll take care of the, you know, tuition for them. And uh, so I just want to put that out there. And one other initiative I have, Satch, is that, uh, you know, from going around to these state trial or organizations and just being at AAJ and talking to some of the folks from the, the NATLE, you know, the National Association of Trial Lawyer Executives, that, you know, the vast majority of people are never going to, you know, wander, you know, leave their state TLAs to, you know, come to Trial Lawyers University or come to AAJ or any of the national programs. And so, I really want to, you know, have a bigger outreach. And so if there's anybody that wants to invite their, you know, their executive director of their trial lawyers organizations to come to Vegas, maybe have some, you know, that way they get to meet more of the great trial lawyers. They can invite them to come to their states. And, and so if they get in touch with me, I will give those executive directors a, 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 a ticket, a scot, not a scot, but a ticket to the event so they can come and, and see it and maybe get some ideas to bring home to their state trial lawyers and associations to help improve the learning that's going on, you know, in every state and locally. So those are a couple of initiatives that I have for 2024. So those are awesome. Looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in, well, I'll probably see you before Vegas at somewhere or another, but maybe not. You never know because you're going to trial. So that'll be great. So Satch, thanks for visiting with us. And I think that, uh, I think, I think that that's all we got. Have a great day. Great job, Dan. Thanks, buddy. Ready to train with the Titans and set records with your verdicts? Register for our live conferences and boot camps at triallawyersuniversity.com. Start getting your reps in before the big event by going to tluondemand.com to gain instant access to live lectures, case analysis, and skills training videos from the trial lawyer champions you love and respect, as well as pleadings, transcripts, PowerPoints, and notes for a roadmap to victory. Join the group that continues to get extraordinary results. Trial Lawyers University.